the project founder and manager of the Eagle Reintroduction Wales project. I've been working with raptors now for over 12 years in raptor research and monitoring and also wild injured releases as well. Um, I've been working actually with eagles for about five years now. I started with a very exciting project up in, um, up in Scotland in 2015-2016 uh, where I was working with satellite tracked eagles in the Mondalia Mountains being mentored by Roy Dennis and this is really where the idea come from is over a cup of tea uh, with Roy Dennis before I come home to Wales um, so we discussed extensively about the potential of eagles coming back to Wales and um, I come home and designed a six to seven year feasibility study to assess if this you know is a feasible option um, so by 2017 uh, we was fortunate, fortunate to get funding from Welsh Government um, under the European Social Fund um, as a CAS PhD scholarship so that we could launch the feasibility studies here in Wales. And we haven't done this alone. We have an extensive team of collaborations, including Cardiff University, South Wales, uh, South and West Wildlife Trust Wales as well, um, and Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation. And we're also now working with multiple eagle experts, um, including the South of Scotland Golden Eagle Project, um, eagle experts in Scotland that work with both species, and the Golden Eagle Trust, which um, obviously was the last, apart from the Isle of Wight reintroduction, to release both or restore both the white-tailed and golden eagle in Wales. So hopefully today we um, will give you an insight uh, around our research um, timelines and how practical it is um, to restore these magnificent birds back to our Welsh landscape. So the main focus of the RW project is to assess if modern whales can still hold both the golden eagle um, and white-tailed eagle. And it's inevitable that the Welsh landscape has changed significantly since eagles last bred here over 150 years ago. But eagle reintroductions are not a novel concept. They have been suggested by experts for many, many years. And no wonder why. Wales has extensive long stretches of coastline um, suitable for white-tailed seagulls. Um, and we have marvellous upland habitats. Um, I saw an actual research paper today saying that some of these mountain ranges in Wales are actually part of our very small um, wild areas across Britain. So over the course of the talk today um, I will be going over how, why, what and when. So how do we go about reintroductions? Why are we proposing a reintroduction for Wales? What do we need to consider? and when will a reintroduction happen? So before we jump to the nitty gritty of the ERW project, it would be rude not to introduce you to our native eagles. So there's two native eagles to Wales and across the British Isles, and that is the golden eagle, Arariarad, and the white-tailed eagle, Arariamore. And both species are rare breeders here in Britain, but they're also a conservation concern. Um, Golden eagles are a conservation concern across Europe and white-tailed eagles hold a higher conservation status and are a conservation concern across the globe. And both eagles belong to the Aquidae family, which contains eagles, hawks and buzzards. And an eagle in lay terms is just a common name for many large birds of prey which are active during the day. And it's safe to say that both of our eagles take all basic eagle boxes. They're big, they have broad wings, they're brown, and they are actively seen soaring high in the sky, dwarfing any of the bird species that approach them. But despite their similarities, um, both species belong to different genre groups and differ in their behavior and lifestyles. So golden eagles belong to the booted eagle family, which are well known for their pursuit hunting strategies. So they like 
um, live prey and they chase and they have multiple <clears throat> ways of hunting and chase these live prey. Um, well, whereas the white-tailed eagle is part of our sea eagle family and they have very different hunting strategies. So they are more ambush hunters. So research has shown that 95% of their day is sitting perched, probably waiting for food to come to them, who knows? Um, but they are our biggest bird of prey here in Wales with over, you know, well, males have seven, foot wingspan and uh, females have much larger, you know, reaching about eight foot. Um, so they're known as flying barn doors and they, they, are, they are big species to look at compared to our red kite and buzzards, but they are completely harmless species. They are really lazy species. They, they're extreme food pirates, um, they're scavengers as well, and extreme off, you know, they have a wide array of um, prey. Um, so, you know, despite their similarities, like I said, they have very different behaviours and they also occupy different habitats as well. So the golden eagle is well known for um, inhabiting upland habitats across Europe. Um, but they are actually a generalist species. So if you look at Scotland, for example, they also inhabit coastlines and lowland areas as well. So they're a, an extreme generalist um, in regards to their habitat selection. And they prey upon um, really ground dwelling mammals and birds. But depending on their habitat, for example, in Scotland, if they're in coastal areas, seabirds are, and rabbits are a big part of their diet. And by contrast, white-tailed seagulls, um, their habitats are mainly associated, associated to aquatic resources like coastlines, um, estuaries, wetlands and inland lakes. And one of the primary reasons why this is a habitat requirement is because in the spring and summer, they mostly feed on fish and water birds. And then in the, in the winter, um, they change their diet to more mammals, and, um, and inland lakes like water birds as well. So both species really have a broad array of prey to select from and um, inhabit multiple habitats. And because both of these species are um, apex predators, they're actually a really good complementary study species to study for, for a reintroduction program. And here's um, here's uh, the diets, of course, of um, of golden and white-tailed eagles as well, and so catfish. <laughs> and so, how do we go about a reintroduction? So, reintroductions are not as simple as most people make out. You can't just click your fingers and release these species free willy into the uh, the Welsh landscape. Reintroduction programs are a strict, highly regulated and licensing process. And in the case of Wales, the authority figure um, in charge of all, um, allocating our species licenses are Natural Resources Wales. And these license applications are usually in, um, they're really comprehensive. They're in, um, usually in um, a format of a number of reports hitting upon um, the biological, environmental, ecological, and socioeconomic uh, and not, oh, I can't even get my words out today, socio-economical feasibilities of restoring these species. So can they biologically survive? Is the environment right for them? What about the ecological risks and benefits? And, you know, do these, the restoration of these eagles fit into the political, social and economic structure here in Wales? And license applications um, are different for every species. Um, and that is simply because every species has different critical dependencies on their landscapes, on other species, and on their ecosystem. So and especially, that is certainly the case for both of our feasibility studies for golden and white-tailed seagulls. So how do we know what questions to address so there's a standard criteria for reintroductions um, across the UK and Europe, and that is all set out by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So all of ERW's research questions um, are shaped around the requirements needed by IUCN and NRW. And over the last three years, 
um, we have delved deep into the biological and environmental feasibility. So any well-planned reintroduction starts at the first phases and that's assessing whether it is right for the species, for example, and whether the environment of whales is um, sustainable enough to restore them. So today, you know, my talk will be shaped around the research on the biological and environmental feasibilities. So the biological feasibility is obviously um, around the biology of the species and um, what this report um, is kind of shaped around is why is a reintroduction the most acceptable option for the species? So we already know that it will help the conservation because they're a conservation concern. But what about the history of eagles in Wales, the cause of extinction in the first place? Um, other reintroductions? Why whales would benefit this species? And the biology of donor stocks and the impact on donor stocks are all questions that we've addressed in this report. So let's start with the history of eagles. So the history of eagles in, across Britain has been well studied by the likes of Derek Yaldin and Richard Evans. So this is where we started. We had a look at gathering evidence to provide to NRW that these species were widespread and common across Wales. Unfortunately, because of the Welsh language, there was a language barrier within previous research that has been um, conducted across Britain. So much so that Wales only had 25 common records for both species. Now 25 records is simply not enough to feed into a reintroduction and provide evidence. So we had to start here by gathering Welsh resources um, like place names, for example, incorporating eagle in the Welsh language, Aru. Um, archaeological records, we had a look at ornithological reports as well and books, persecution records, historic um, from newspaper articles and um, what we found is you know it is, is absolutely amazing and also we visited a number of museum specimens as well across Wales um, and we from those 25 records we now have 151 records across Wales for both species um, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think it's 79 um, species uh, records for golden eagles um, and the rest would be white-tailed seagulls. And as you can see here, that we have a record for every county across Wales, suggesting that these birds were widespread and common. Um, and also what these coloured kernels show is their last activities or their spatial distribution or predicted spatial distribution before they become extinct. So this is the uh, um, 18th and 19th century distribution are these coloured kernels here. So golden eagles as expected um, resorted or took sanctuary um, during the 18th and 19th century in the hills of Snowdonia. Whereas the white-tailed eagle had a much more wider distribution, we've got nest sites um, up till 1860 on the Thin Peninsula, for example, and also nest sites up until 1820 on Kenfig um, burrows. Um, so, so we have evidence of nest and uh, nests as well for both species. Um, <clears throat> in regards to archaeological reports, um, we have records dating back to the Neolithic period just to show how, <clears throat> how far these species go back to the Welsh landscape. So with these, <clears throat> excuse me, with these birds <clears throat> being heavily um, named within place names, they're not, they were not only widespread and common, but they were also a big part of our um, heritage and culture as well here in Wales. What about the cause of extinction? Now, Sadly, both eagles fell victim to ruthless hunting um, and were wiped out of the Welsh landscape by 1860. And sadly, there's no other evidence here in Wales um, to suggest any other reason other than persecution that was responsible for the loss of our birds. And this was a common trend across Britain, across Europe, for many, many birds of prey um, in the 19th century. 
Um, and due to the extinction being primarily down to, you know, humans, we believe that we have a moral duty to restore them. But what the IUCN criteria, the most important evidence that we need to provide to NRW is whether the cause of extinction has been reduced or eliminated in the Welsh landscape. Now persecution, and research shows this, persecution across Britain has significantly declined since historic times because if you know back in back in the days where pers historic persecution was rife, it completely wiped out our our, um, our birds of prey. Um, in Wales, that that's not the case. Um, but however, persecution still does happen um, across Britain. One thousand three hundred twenty nine confirmed reports over the last twelve years. And obviously, the most of these reports are correlated to England with over 735, um, with shooting being the most prevalent way of eliminating these birds. And Scotland, um, I can't see my figure because my face is in the way, but it's over, I think it's over about 450 birds um, and, and mostly due to poisoning, I believe, if I remember rightly, the figures. And with whales, we only have 85 birds um, recorded um, and the main reason for this is because we have a very different land use in Wales. So as if many of you follow the raptor persecution, you know that most of them are associated to the shooting industry and um, particularly grouse moors. Um, and this is what's happening in, in England and Scotland in our rural landscapes. Um, but in Wales, our rural landscapes scapes are primarily um, used for livestock pasture. So 75% of Wales is allocated to livestock grazing. We have a very small shooting industry um, and it's very different to England and Scotland because our shooting estates, and there's around 55 um, shooting estates across Wales, are primarily pheasants. I think I only know of one or two grouse shooting estates. So we believe that because of the land use is extremely different in Wales, this is why it's correlated to a much lower persecution rate. In all, um, oh, why isn't it not working? <laughs> so another part of our research to show um, evidence to NRW that persecution has been reduced in the Welsh landscape is to conduct research on our current raptors. Now, Wales holds a very healthy um, raptor population. Um, so what we've done is we've mapped breeding areas. So these are what the um, yellow kernels are across all of these maps. And we've had a look how how ecologically similar species are used in the Welsh landscape and how certain land uses are influencing their distributions in order to provide proxy measures for how eagles would um, be influenced by the Welsh landscape. Now, from our generalist raptors, you know, red kites, common buzzards are doing extremely well here in Wales. Red, red kites, are, you know, the recolonisation of red kites here in Wales is a massive success story. Um, we also have one of the largest populations of natural breeding peregrines here in Wales as well. Um, so they're doing particularly well um, in, some, in, in most regions of Wales. And also the recolonization of our rarer species, like our ospreys and our hen harriers, provide irrefutable evidence that attitudes are changing here in Wales and um, that these raptors are not only recolonizing their ranges but doing particularly well. So hen harriers, for example, we've got quite a dense population of hen harriers. I think the um, I last time I heard is about 34 breeding pairs. That's quite a healthy population compared to England um, and, and Scotland. So yeah, the, our raptors are doing really well, providing irrefutable evidence that uh, of the reduction really of persecution rates here in Wales. Um, what about other range reductions? So I mentioned at the start of the talk that eagle range reductions are not a novel concept. And we're working with a number of eagle experts um, across Britain now to share, um, to share expertise and knowledge really in best practices. So we'll start with white-tailed seagulls. So white-tailed seagulls have been reintroduced um, as a traditional method now 
in, um, in Britain since the 1970s. And um, so here's Roy and his team in the 1970s reintroducing um, the first batch of whitetail seagulls from Norway um, to the Isle of Rum. And uh, white-tailed eagles become extinct across the British landscape in 1916. Um, and, you know, the, the colonization or, or um, the, the reason why now we have white-tailed seagulls back in Britain is because of a rolling scheme of reintroduction programs. They've, like I said, first were reintroduced to the Isle of Wren, um, also across the west coast of Scotland as well and islands of Scotland. And they've also now been reintroduced into the east coast of Scotland as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And in the, um, I think it was two, between 2001 and 2003, <coughs> um, white-tailed eagles were also reintroduced um, to Killinary National Park in southwest Ireland. And here's Alan Mee and his team here um, reintroducing the birds to Ireland. And in more recent, um, actually in 2019, um, white-tailed eagles have now also been restored um, or starting to be restored down in the Isle of Wight. And here's um, Roy and his team um, releasing the first batch here. Uh, and so basically, Wales is now the only country that hasn't contributed to the conservation or to restore this species across their native ranges. The golden eagle has a very different story. So the golden eagle never become extinct um, uh, across Britain. It become extinct across Wales or southern Britain, but a small population was founded in the north east um, of Scotland and heavily concerned, uh, conserved. And from that conservation and protection, um, the population have expanded now to over 525 um, breeding pairs across across Scotland. Um, because they have a healthy breeding population up in Scotland, they reintroduced around about the same time as, as the Irish um, white-tailed seagull reintroduction, eagles into Donegal National Park, um, where there's now believed to be about three to four breeding pairs. Um, and also more recently, I think in 2018 or 2019, um, south of Scotland also topped up their population. So they had two breeding pairs and they were bringing down youngsters from Scotland in hope that they will start recolonizing northern parameters of Britain. So we have a very extensive knowledge um, of eagle reintroductions in order to make this a success in Wales. So why Wales? And this comes down to the biology of the species. So what we found um, is there's no chance of natural colonization to Wales. And we're talking about the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and it's down to the biology of, of both species. So both the eagles are long lived species and they have um, low reproductive rates. So for example, they live over 30 years um, on average. For, um, the oldest golden eagle was found in 2018 to be 36 years of age before dying of natural causes. And they normally have, so golden eagles normally have between one and two chicks per year, but only one fledge. That's the, that's the average, average for uh, productivity rate. And for white-tailed seagulls, they normally lay three eggs or on average one to two chicks fledge the nest. Um, so they have low reproductive rates as well. Um, another characteristic of both species is they have very slow sexual maturation ages. So these birds don't sexually mature until the age of five um, before entering the breeding population. And within those first five years, they're extremely nomadic, um, using temporary settlement areas to learn their landscapes. Um, which obviously provides um, quite a lot of risk in the environment as well for in the first couple of years of life. Another characteristic is that they, both species um, have natal philopatry, which means that when they reach breeding age and enter the breeding population, 
they breed in close proximity to their natal areas. So this, um, you know, this allows a very slow population growth. So for example, white-tailed eagles were reintroduced in the 1970s and over 50 years, only now 130 breeding pairs um, have been established in Scotland. So it's very slow population growth rate. So this is why we believe that there's no chance of natural colonization because breeding populations are too far north to, co you know, to colonize, um, to start breeding in Wales. Now, what we've also found is why eagle reintroductions work so well is that release sites act as artificial natal areas. And we use Isle of Wight as an example. So I think between 10 and 12 birds have been reintroduced over the last 12 years, uh, 12 years, two years um, to the Isle of Wight now, and they're all satellite tagged. So they have a wide range. They have exploratory flights all across England. Um, they've been seen in Scotland and on the borders of Wales as well. They always come back to the Isle of Wight. What, what happens then is when they reach breeding age, they will come back to the Isle of Wight to breed. And that's what we're hoping, you know, to create an artificial natal area in Wales so we can start establishing a breeding population here as well. So we believe that in regards to the biology of the species, reintroductions are the most acceptable option. And what about donor stocks and impact on donor stocks? So we were fortunate enough to go out to Norway a couple of, um, I, I think it was 2019 now, I completely missed 2020, I don't know where I was. Um, but yeah, so we went out to Norway to, to source and see the logistics of bringing, bringing eagles over. We've also, you know, looked it up in Scotland as well. But one of the main criteria, I suppose, for, for um, the IUCN is whether to, to get birds from the nearest source population um, that has a very similar genetics to the, or comparison genetics with the, the historic um, eagles that would have been in Britain. So we'll start with the golden eagle. So we know the nearest population is in Scotland. And we know that golden eagles have um, a number of subspecies across their range, but there is only one subspecies across Europe. So we know that, you know, by sourcing our birds from Scotland, that they would be, you know, um, viable genetically to to restore to Wales and we also know that they will have no impact on the population because that we have over 528 breeding pairs so it is common knowledge really in the eagle industry um, that you know we need to be releasing between 5 and 12 or 15 birds per year over a five-year period um, so the minimum, you know, releasing 50 to 70 birds um, to, to create a long term population here in Wales. Um, so that is we know from our population models that that sourcing golden eagles from Scotland is the most appropriate donor stock. For white-tailed seagulls is a, is a bit of a different story. So we know that the nearest population is in Scotland. However, in Scotland, they only have 130 breeding pairs and they're already being used to source birds, to, to, sorry, to translocate birds to the Isle of Wight. So by taking another, um, you know, 50 to 70 birds from that population could be a risk. So we've decided that um, in regards to our source population in Wales, that we would be sourcing our birds from Norway. Um, and this is simply because most of our British birds are from Norwe Norwegian origin anyway. And unlike golden eagles, there's only one subspecies of white-tailed seagull across the globe. So we know that we meet the criteria for getting them from Norway. Um, so, oh, sorry. So we know from all of this evidence that we've gathered, that a reintroduction is the most acceptable option for the conservation of the species. But what about the environmental feasibility? And the environmental feasibility is all about whether the Welsh landscape is suitable or is, you know, is a reintroduction the most acceptable option for Wales? And this is now looking at 
uh, modern resources, you know, how much suitable habitat is the land, a modern land use compatible to these species now, prey availability, nest sites, um, release sites, and do they fit into conservation initiatives here in Wales? So let's start with suitable habitat. So what we've done um, in a Cardiff is we've worked with eagle experts to map breeding ranges of both species in Scotland. So we've looked at and had a look at the habitat characteristics within those territories, found or modelled trends and then mapped them to characterise all habitats which are very similar across the British landscape. So we not, have not only helped, I've done this for Wales, but we've done it for the whole of Britain as well to help the conservation of, of the species. So what we found is that Wales ha is, you know, Wales for golden eagles and white-tailed eagles are highly suitable. We have a number of mountain ranges which still hold um, suitable habitat for these birds. Um, what the colours mean, the, the red areas are highly suitable, the yellow areas are suitable, the green areas are um, average and then the blue areas are not suitable at all. <laughs> so 46% of Wales is suitable for the golden eagle and 51% of our coastlines are suitable for white-tailed seagulls. And the reason why we focused on coastlines is um, because we, you know, because for in Norway, that's their main kind of habitat association. Um, so what we've done is we've used these uh, species distribution models to create the baseline of our feasibility studies to start gathering regional evidence. So we've, we've highlighted 12 areas of focus for golden eagles and we'll also, um, you know, we've also been looking at lowland areas as well. And <clears throat> for, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, for white-tailed seagulls, 14 coastal areas of priority and we'll also have a look at the inland capacity as well um, for future future expansion in, in, due, in due course for example. Um, what about land use compatibility? So we'll have a look at the golden eagle um, suitability. So this is um, habitat that is suitable across Wales for the golden eagle. But the proportion of suitable habitat does not mean that it's available for eagles to occupy today. And that's simply because of perils from people and modern day land uses. So what we've done is we've had a look at land use compatibility. So we've taken modern land uses that influence eagles across Britain or Europe. And we've assessed how they influence each region. <clears throat> so most of our feasibility studies are in this format. Um, which creates visual aids to help us explain through these talks and to stakeholders and to the community um, <clears throat> what, you know, where our best eagle habitats are. So basically, this, you know, livestock pasture has an, a direct and indirect effect on um, eagle habitat quality and particularly historic grazing because historic grazing changes habitat structure, for example, moorland, um, that, that thick mosaic shrubby like vegetation to short grass species, which then alters the um, ability for, you know, the main prey of eagles. So livestock pasture, like I mentioned earlier, covers 75% of the Welsh landscapes. That's a huge proportion. So it's something that we've taken into consideration, <clears throat> how much livestock pasture or eagle habitats overlap, for example. And as you can see here, um, the top three areas which are less or least affected by livestock pasture is Snowdonia National Park. Commercial conifer plantations is also something we've take, taken a look at, um, of particular importance for nesting white-tailed seagulls. But for golden eagles, um, golden eagles prefer open upland habitats or open habitats in general. And what commercial conifer plantations do is they change that open landscape um, to closed canopy dense habitats, um, which obviously eagles or golden eagles struggle to breed or hunt in. And we've, when we've looked into this, 7% of our upland habitat has now been lost to commercial, um, commercial conifer plantations. 
So that's something we've obviously taken consideration of. Raptor persecution incidents, um, we've already covered some, but like I said, it still, uh, still does happen in Wales. And um, most, most of you have probably read that um, the post-mortem of Edwina, the golden eagle, which was living in Tregaron, and there was evidence of her being shot. Um, not, it wasn't the cause of her death. Um, it was a natural disease, a fungal infection, which killed her, unfortunately. Um, but she did have a, um, a historic um, injury to her uh, below her knee. Um, so it does still happen. And obviously, th these, this such analysis really can help us, you know, with public engagement and really getting communities on board, um, you know, and addressing these concerns in our rural landscapes. As you can see, you know, most of the ranges where our ospreys and hen harriers are, you know, there's hardly any persecution recorded in these regions. Um, and like I said, this big red dot here is actually Glanisk Estate, um, where I think is something like uh, 15 birds out of the 85 recorded in Wales has been found here. Um, hence the fact that it's, it's such a bright red dot. Um, what we've also done is we've had a look at uh, the proportion of suitable habitat lost, so to urban areas, for example. And what we found is urban areas cover 4% of Wales. Um, so we've still got quite a lot of rural areas which are um, you know, not occupied by intense human habituation, for example. But what I found quite um, quite interesting i suppose when I, I when we mapped this was urban areas actually cover less proportion of the terrestrial surface than our commercial forestry plantations here in wales so that's interesting within itself but 60 percent of the population is in south wales so this is where we've lost most of our eagle habitats um and wind farms as well um, wind farms provide um you know indirect and direct um, influences on eagles and we found that <clears throat> for golden eagles they can displace birds of prey up to four kilometers especially areas or wind to, uh, wind farms with over six wind turbines so we've had a look at the proportion of habitat loss to these features as well and as you can see snowdonia for golden eagles um, and lower cambrian mountains and the fan Gothen and Berrien ranges are you know, the least influenced really by, by wind farms. Um, so taking all of this land use um, compatibility into consideration, this is what our historic eagle habitat um, loss really looks like. So you can see now with golden eagles that it's starting to become, especially inland areas, it's starting to become rather fragmented. Um, with white-tailed seagulls, we have less fragmentation. Obviously, that obviously the same areas are influenced, um, but you know they are, they are a much more suitable species. So we've found out that five point three percent of golden eagle habitat has been lost to modern day land uses, and four point nine percent of habitat has been lost for white-tailed seagulls. So leaving quite a still a high proportion of suitable habitats here, <clears throat> albeit for golden eagles rather fragmentary, but still a high proportion. So what about nest sites? So for nest sites, um, we've mapped potential nest sites across, across Wales for both species. So for golden eagles here in yellow, um, they mostly um, nest in crags um, in upland or coastal habitats. So we've mapped and had a look at where the, you know, where those most, or well, where the high proportion of those crags or potential nest sites are. And as you can see here, Snowdonia again, upper central Snowdonia is coming up as, as the highest proportion of nest sites, um, including lower Snowdonia as well, Cambrian Mountains, Brecon Beacons National Park as well, um, do have some, some nest sites available. For white-tailed seagulls, they are a much more generalist species. They can, um, they mostly like mature trees. Um, so we've had a look, we've done this for inland areas as well, um, but we've only showed you today the coastal areas. So there's plenty of um, 
uh, mature trees across our coastlines. Um, Pembrokeshire National Park actually comes out on top for the most nest sites for, for white-tailed eagles in regards to trees. And Isle of Anglesey comes up on top um, for coastal crag nests, for example, and the Thin Peninsula also is highly suitable um, for nesting white-tailed seagulls. What about prey availability? So we have, and this took us quite a while, um, we have now um, assessed prey densities of key mammals and birds across Wales for each species. And the, what these tables, um, I'll try to explain these tables as much as I can. So what these um, numbers are, are the, in reference to the biogeographic regions um, so each so in each region these are the prey densities we've also added a, a row here or column with um, um, number 13 which covers all lowland areas so if we um, color these in, in in a hierarchy system we can see that for golden eagles the main prey base is actually in lowland whales um, Quite, not really surprising, um, but there are quite a lot more of staple prey items in, in, in lowland whales for golden eagles. So the green areas are coming up as sufficient areas of prey for golden eagles and the reds are obviously not really sufficient enough to sustain these birds. So upper and central Snowdonia here is coming up as a suitable prey base. Um, Cambrian Mountains here for number seven, and also these small ranges of the Black Mountains and Hay on Wai as well are coming up as suitable. Um, for white seagulls, um, they have a lot more bird, uh, bird species enlisted. But as you can see here, there are a lot more green areas for white seagulls. So Isle of Anglesey comes up um, as the top have, uh, top prey base for white-tailed seagulls, followed by Pembrokeshire National Park. We've also got here um, these columns, which or oh, these these columns, which are um, the Glaslyn, Maudach, and Duffy estuaries, and also um, quite surprisingly, the Gower Peninsula uh, has a sufficient prey base. So what about release sites? And the way that we've um, the way that we've done this is we've had a so we've put all of our data together, and um, so this is this is um, the same kind of um, thing that you've seen before in this in this figure, but in a table format. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is to show the comparison between the two species. So as you can see here. There are regions of Wales which are highly suitable for white sea uh, for golden eagle, sorry, but there are quite a lot of regions which can be high risk to these birds. Um, when we look at the golden eagle release sites, when we merge all our, uh, our all of our feasibility studies together, three areas come up as the best areas, the best golden eagle habitats in Wales. And that is Upper Central Snowdonia National Park and the Cambrian Mountains. So moving forward um, for golden eagles, this, these are the areas that we would focus on um, in, in due course. However, in comparison, um, you can see for white-tailed seagulls, there it, there's less fragmentary habitat. So from from, Pem uh, from Pembrokeshire National Park down here, all the way up to Isle of Anglesey, is highly suitable for white-tailed seagulls. And that is a very large stretch of coastline which can help the conservation of these birds. So when we look at release sites for, 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 for white-tailed seagulls, we have a lot more to choose from which obviously um, makes us realise that the white-tailed eagle, you know, would be our first species to restore here in Wales. So we have five areas of focus, um, which we will be moving on to and focusing on these regions now in the upcoming years. So um, Isle of Anglesey comes up as the top habitat for white-tailed seagulls, followed by Pembrokeshire National Park and also the Duffy, Maudach and Glaslyn as well. 
Um, and conservation initiatives. So do, uh, does the restoration fit into conservation initiatives in Wales? Well, we know that both species are flagship species. So by restoring these birds, we're not only restoring biodiversity, heritage and culture, but we're restoring ecosystem functions. Um, so ecosystem functions like controlling prey, um, regulating biodiversity, um, eliminating diseases, scavenging, you know, bringing more scavengers and cleaning up mechanisms, you know, linking habitats. So white-tailed seagulls, for example, are key resource and uh, trophic linkers between um, aquatic and um, woodland and, and forestry, for example. So they are bringing um, ecological functions that we have been missing for over 150 years. What we've also found is that uh, priority habitats enlisted um, as a conservation importance across Wales all fit into the habitat requirements of both of the eagle species. So by restoring these species, we can also highlight the conservation of um, or the conservation importance of these habitats and also the issues that are related with them um, and also obviously bring a lot more um, health to our biodiversity within, within these regions. Um, but what we've also found is that eagles would benefit conservation initiatives here in Wales, but um, actually Wales would also help in the opposite way around. Um, as you can see here, so the yellow and blue maps show um, the suitable habitats for both species, and then the orange, um, well, the orange bits of this map show um, protected areas. So as you can see, there is a large proportion of, of suitable habitat, which already lies within protected areas across Wales. So we know that by working as a national effort, that, we, that, the, that, it will, that these species will fit in to the conservation initiatives here in Wales. Um, so yeah, so we all in all, over the last three years, we found that a reintroduction to Wales is the most acceptable option for the conservation of the species. And we've also found that it is an acceptable option for Wales as well. So rounding up the talk, um, when will a reintroduction happen? Now we do understand that there has been a lot of <clears throat> media attention around these birds coming here ASAP. Now we can confirm that, that in regards to our collaborations and in regards to the IUCN process and the NRW process, it's not going to happen as quickly as the media has stated. <clears throat> And that's simply because <clears throat> there's not enough evidence here in Wales that has been addressed. <clears throat> we hold most of the evidence um, and with all, with our collaborations and with, you know, our uh, work with the Ireland team, the South Scotland team and the Scottish teams as well, the ego reintroductions, these processes take normally on average between five and seven years. And that's simply to gather the evidence um, to make sure you know, that you're addressing concerns in, you know, and there is a national effort you know, most, you know, with stakeholders and the public are extremely important processes. And that is not a quick turnaround. <clears throat> um, so what we, um, we are on track to meet these targets, so this time frame. We're 50% now, we've spent three years obviously gathering um, evidence and we're 50% through our feasibility studies. We will be starting with white-tailed seagulls and from this talk we hopefully, you know, you kind of understand why we would be starting with white-tailed seagulls. Golden eagles will take a bit longer and that's simply because we would like to make sure that the environment and the habitat is right for these species before we bring them back. Um, ERW is not about um, how quickly this can be done. ERW is about creating this as a national effort and putting the welfare of these birds first. So the next steps for us is to complete regional analysis now in, in these potential release sites. Um, so, you know, working uh, regionally, hopefully, um, coronavirus permitted, 
you know, um, in these regions. Um, we're also now looking at the, the benefits, benefits and risks of um, biodiversity. So, you know, breeding birds, wintering birds, um, rare mammals and how, and how these birds could influence them, for example, in these regions. Um, and also work with communities and stakeholders, which is the, the biggest part. We've already done, you know, we, we've worked, we've had meetings with NFU, we've had meetings with um, all sorts of different stakeholders across Wales. But now that we're at the stage where we know this is feasible, we can now ramp up, um, hopefully, with the funding behind us, the, the community um, and stakeholder engagement. And of course, working on the best translocation methods for eagles in Wales, it's not an easy task translocating these birds, you know, from Scotland, for example, or Norway. So it, it is, does need to be heavily planned. So those are the next steps for us, really. Um, so yeah, so Dioch and Vauren Vando, thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, I really hope that you've enjoyed the talk and we'll open up now for any questions.